Hello everyone and welcome to Agala's Current Affairs, a marine science podcast set in South Africa with me as one of your hosts, Dr. Yanis Kisson of Gikoscopy Media, alongside Dr. Nelson Miranda of Argonaut Science. And today we are getting specific. Very, very specific. <laughs> as specific as you can get when it comes to biology. Yeah, you. I mean, we hear it all the time, these species. What species is this, isn't it? It's a very common sort of uh, scientific speak, scientific uh, jargon. Mm, oh, it's jargon. a species here, a species there. What's a, but what is, what is this species? You know what I mean? What does it relate yeah, to? Yeah, What's yeah. the relationship of species? What is it? Uh, why, why do we care? Yeah, uh, yeah that's what we're going to talk so, about today. So in, in biology, um, we, well, one of... In biology, we like to describe, and in science and nature, we like to describe things about the natural world and and what happens to it and explain why and how. Um, and a good way of doing this is actually having names for things that everybody like agrees on. So that when you know you're talking about one thing, that each scientist in that field kind of more or less understands what you're talking about. When it comes to living things, there are a lot of them. And we have to find ways of kind of grouping them together so that um, scientists can then understand when somebody is speaking about one particular animal and this particular group of animals, like um, animals that might, you know, operate together or be closely related to each other. Like you could be like to your cousin, um, but in terms of like a different group of animals. So the most functional basic unit of a group of animals is a species. So like in general general terms, when you go outside and like look at a bird, let's say a pigeon, and you see most of the pigeons more or less look the same. We call that a species of pigeon. Yeah, I mean, I guess you also need to take into account what a pigeon, is a pigeon related to an eagle? And is an eagle related <laughs> yeah. to a lizard? And is a lizard related to a dog? Yeah. Or, you know, and, yeah, you know, yeah. what about an ape? What about, you know, a plant? What about a tree? What about an algae? What about the dolphin? Because, you know, marine yeah. species are in there too, you know. What about the copepod? Have you ever heard of this strange thing? We're going to talk about copepods <laughs> yeah. one day. Underrated, um, underrated taxonomic group. Super copepods. underrated. And yet, you know, <laughs> copepods, diatoms, we're going to definitely be talking about those in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, it also needs to relate to something that, you know, people might have heard of um, the tree of life. Wow, you know? So, I mean, you might have heard of this idea that there's an organization of life, you know, there's a hierarchy, you know, there's a general, it goes from the general to the very specific. And I guess that's the, the word specific and species does have a connection there, isn't it? Because it's very specific. Um, but, you know, in, in general life, you actually have this, you know, things are sort of grouped into major general groups with certain characteristics. And then, you know, they get more and more specific and then eventually you get a species. And um, so, so you can look at the whole of life and, uh, and then these groups, they, they actually, you know, the, the, the practice, the discipline of naming these things is actually, it's got a name, it's called taxonomy, isn't it? And all of these groups are called taxa, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And taxonomy, the naming of these groups of things, isn't it? Actually, I have, I have a funny joke. So if we go through the, the, the you know, the, the tree of life, because there's a hierarchy, it goes life, then it goes something like domain, or, and then kingdom, isn't it? And then phylum, class, order, family, then genus, and then species at the bottom. Is that right? Yeah, that sounds more or less correct, yeah. No, no stand, stand by for the joke. I even have a little graphic. Okay. Stand by for the okay. joke. All right. What it says here, taxonomy is the study of organisms and how you file them, right? How you file them. How you file them. I, you got a file cabinet. This is, this, is a, this is a taxonomy joke because there's a file cabinet, you know, yeah, and the word yeah, phylum yeah. sounds like file. 
Okay, now we've over-explained everything. No, no, no. <laughs> it was funny for two seconds, and now you over-explained it. For sure. Well, it's for the yeah, podcast. So... <laughs> Benefit of the podcast, people who can't see images. Yeah, yeah, for sure, 100%. Um, so, yeah, there is that whole kind of like tree of life and hierarchy, I think. We might have to do a separate topic on like taxonomy to kind of explain each one in more detail. But we're going to focus in on species today because that's kind of probably on your in your day-to-day -day activity, even not as a scientist, I think species is probably the most uh, kind of useful um, to you. Like if you think about going to like the grocery store or whatever, you're buying specific type of animals or or fish, like in the episode we talked about at Sassy. Um, it's, it's a good idea to know more or less and understand the differences between between species. So there's no actual um, single definition of species. It's kind of, it depends on the perspective that you're taking. Um, there is one kind of generally um, understood, used, like functional definition, and I'll talk about um, that later. But throughout history, what, the single way that we could use, because we started off only being able to use our, our eyes as tools for being able mm -hmm. to identify things, um, was how they looked, like their, their morphology, like kind of judging the book based on the cover because you can only really see the cover at this point. Um, so that's what we call like morphologically distinct species or the, the morphological um, definition of, of species. Um, and it's basically scientists that go around like looking at things and like writing down, like describing um, like, okay, there's two eyes, as nose that's like big, it has like, a long tail, like maybe that species has a short tail. And you go and you kind of like describe everything about them. And then once you have that description, then you can confidently say, at least that point in time, that this is a species because it, it looks that way. And everything that looks that way is probably the same thing we think. Yeah. What do you think about that, Nelson? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's also, you you could measure things, you can draw things. So biological drawings, you know, used to be mm -hmm. a big, big deal, you know. And still, still today, if you are a university student at some stage in first year, you'll be doing some biological drawings, you know, by hand. Mm -hmm. um, and because, I mean, things that have certain shapes tend to, we tend to like to put those into boxes. And then also some of the features of these shapes can actually be distinct. It has been useful to a certain extent to tell apart different species. Sometimes you look at uh, uh, the leg hairs on a, um, you know, <laughs> one of the legs of a tiny little crustacean and that's, and then you look for a little bump and that's the only way to tell it apart from a very similar, look, similar, similar looking crustacean, you know, another, mm -hmm. you know, amphipod or something like that, you know. Yeah. Um, so it is useful and even today all the field guides they rely a lot on what things look like generally isn't it so the field guides are nice because if you have a location and you have the most commonly occurring species you can pretty be you can be pretty confident that that's probably what it is isn't it and yet yeah. if you look very closely and if you bring forward an expert on that taxon because the tax is the, <laughs> is the plural taxon is the <laughs> singular then they might tell you oh no 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 this is more complicated than that and that's probably also because in taxonomy throughout history things have been described over and over <laughs> and given yeah. different names you know, so it's a little bit of a mess. And then if people from different parts of the world found the same thing in their travels and they describe it again and again, then you might have many synonyms and many old descriptions. And then you still need to like go through all of the ancient writings and make sure that you give credit to the original the, the person who described yeah. this thing for the first time. And their description might not have been, you know, done to the same standard of a, as a modern description. Because today we still measure things. We take, we take photographs now. I mean, you know, there was no such thing as a camera, you know, in uh, you know, yeah. one thousand BC. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. For sure, hundred percent. And that's why um, sometimes if you see a species name, there'll be like in brackets like somebody's name next to it. That's usually like like a surname. 
and that's because that is a person that probably described it first or that's the kind of generally accepted uh, description for that species so when you're talking about that name you can go back and reference that person and then find you know that name and what it means um but like you said like if you go ask a taxonomist uh this certain species he says but well, I mean, hang on you actually got two species here and then you'll be, you'll be looking weird and be like but they look the same <laughs> how can you yeah. how can you tell that they're different and he has other uh, kind of perspective that you don't have it might, it might be related to other things but we call that type of species a cryptic species because it looks the same they, they might be looking very similar but they actually inhabit two different groups or two different uh, species or two different taxa like you said earlier mm-hmm. um so that's what we call a cryptic species and that's why we also need to use other methods of uh, describing the species and what might contribute to them being a certain group one of the other easier ways that doesn't take like expensive machinery and, and time and money um is looking at the ecology because if you have um species they might look the same but they might be very different because they are in maybe different parts of the world or different ecological niches like maybe one's like um in a lake whereas the others in uh, in the ocean and you know those are very even though it's water it's, those are very different environments um so actually having ecologically distinct species based on like where you where they are with where you find them their particular role um in the environment whether like they uh, feed on different things like you know if you look at like uh, a panda bear and a polar bear like one just looks like a colored in like polar bear maybe yeah. right but but one eats probably any meat that will come across including you and the other is only chomping on bamboo like yeah. the whole day he's a specialist yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah he's, he's, a, he's a very special uh, kind of bear um so taking those things into account which, which is why they're toxic and sex on this be like these are two different species because maybe they take up two different ecological niches and don't really yeah. occur together that's why they're yeah. two different species they can do different jobs they can you know mm-hmm. in the environment so the ecological species concept is strong because it it connects to a practical you know um the practical side of what species do in the environment so their jobs you can look at it like their jobs isn't it and um and then another thing is that some some of these organisms are so small you know these animals these you know uh, living things are so small that sometimes the the different places where you find them they can be you know actually very close together but they, this but so different you know so we call those uh, microcosm you know cosm is like the the space of the universe but you know when you look at the scale that happens a lot in the ocean actually even though the ocean is very connected but you still see big differences you know sometimes within centimeters you know and then you have things that adapt even though they might have been perhaps the same species in the past by virtue of them being in these different microcosms they may actually adapt and uh, they might look the same because you know uh, sometimes things look the same they develop the same sort of shapes you know they converge we call that convergent uh, sort of evolution yeah. where things start looking the same because they do similar jobs you know but uh, that doesn't mean they're the same and then the other problem is that some of these uh, species you could tell them apart except that by the way they look like the the, the shapes and variability you know maybe the maybe the legs They, they can be big or small depending on environmental factors and their niches or you know niches is just like a special place where things live you know uh, where they thrive um, and the, these things could actually overlap do you know what i mean so so you you can't just measure a thing and say okay this is looks very similar it has the same proportions but then you know who knows later on if the temperature changes if the habitat changes maybe things change So there's this big variability which is hard then to very to tell things apart it's, it becomes very difficult that's why maybe it, it, it's cryptic it's complex <laughs> for sure 100% another problem that sometimes comes up and i know this is a, can sometimes be an interesting thing with in paleontology where you know 
we which have a record of what we have found like not even what what might have been out there but like what, what managed mm. to fossilize um and they they also go through the whole process of taxonomically identifying things from from the past and they would have a bunch of different things that might look different um because obviously they've they've fossilized and they look yeah. different um but they go back and realize hang on they're occurring in the same place they look very different they're like different sizes what if this is the same animal but it's a different yeah. stage of their life it like could be different exactly <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that happens very often, man. That actually happens very yeah. often. Where you think, oh, this is completely new species. Meanwhile, it's the baby. <laughs> it's the baby, yeah. <laughs> it's like the edgy teenager that just wanted to like, look different. Yeah, yeah. It's Spiky yeah, hair. So <laughs> just re- exactly. Different colors. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. So that's also a, a problem when it comes to like naming things especially like if if uh, either you just don't have the right perspective or you don't have enough information um you might think that two larvae are like two different species um or like one is like totally separate meanwhile it's just you know the baby of of a bigger yeah. thing. um and i think it's cool that you mentioned uh you know working with animals or organisms or plants or things that are no longer uh, around anymore they fossilized they, mm. they're long gone they're extinct you know we we have mm. when we talk about species we can talk about extinction as well which is when they <laughs> you cannot find that kind of organism anymore yeah. you know it's completely mm. gone and then you still have to work with it you still have to understand because you may uncover you know information that helps you to understand what exists today by looking at what used to exist Uh, and we get a lot of insight, mm. you know, mm. um, and it's definitely easier to um, get a sense for the environment because information about the environment also gets trapped in sediments and rocks and things like that, you know, so having an ecological uh, information is, yeah. is possible yeah. even with things that are no longer around. Yeah, yeah, because things are changing all the time, like species are evolving, like even when we talk about a species, it's kind of like a snapshot in time. Mm. of what this thing is but like th- thousands of years ago it was, it was very different and now there might be two different things that were once one thing before you know, we call it a, a common ancestor and that's what causes like the things moving into new species but thinking about but talking about common ancestor one of the things that on a biological level that we also kind of use to identify a, a species is whether they can actually breed with each other because in general oh, yeah. a species will only be able to breed with another one of its kind right yeah. um, reproduction one yeah one of the ways that they're able to stay a species because yeah. they can identify other members of of uh, you know their group and breed with them and create more of them yeah, so that's what sure. we call the biological definition of species and probably for a long time was our most accurate definition of of how to define a species in in the most functional way i suppose in, in biology um Like I said, until we got bigger and better <laughs> equipment yeah. and had more ideas. Also, it doesn't it doesn't apply for everything. Like we just mentioned, yeah. if you're studying things yeah. that are not alive anymore, how will you know? You know, it's, it's, so you know. you'll get very lucky if they fossilize whilst they're busy breathing. You know, <laughs> and, it, and and even so, you still can't be sure because not only do those organisms need to breed with each other and, and create an offspring, but that offspring must be able to also breathe, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, it, it you know, it obviously, yeah, it needs to also be able to, to, to reproduce. Otherwise, it no go. It's it doesn't count. You know, that's that's what we call uh, what hybrids, isn't it? When you have two different yeah. species and they are able to actually um, produce an offspring together, but that offspring mm. is now unable to reproduce, right? And then, yeah. I mean. Yeah. I mean, the biological species concept is, it can be very useful, but again, it doesn't cover all of life because some things don't reproduce sexually. Some things reproduce asexually, yeah. and already that's going yeah. to become like yeah. a, pro- a problem. Yeah. There's whole lineages of organisms that are asexual reproduction organisms, and that is a lot more common than we think, 
you know <laughs> we think oh that's the exception to the rule but actually no and, and sometimes you know through the history of these <laughs> organisms they 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 switch they switch to asexual yeah. and then sexual and they have whole lineages over even millions of years uh, you know yeah so um, i think yeah if you, if you're talking about like biological like variation and like geological time or deep time we probably the weird ones <laughs> you know the x y the xx gene like there's so many different ways to go about like reproducing and creating new copies of yourself um we probably the weird ones <laughs> we now we do it for sure um also talking about like you know when you have when sometimes when you do have like males and females sometimes the males and females could look totally different which also throws the whole morphological <laughs> idea out here True. um so jeez i forget what you call that Se sexual dimorphism is when yeah. you, the different sexes look very different um, which can be a problem when it comes to to morphology and like you said hybridization um things that could if, if you talk if you heard about a liger before a cross between a tiger mm. and a liger which is like it creates this like massive thing that's bigger than either of those things and it's like white um and yeah. I think, uh, a mule the common one a mule yeah that's the common yeah. one with a between the horse and a donkey yeah yeah, yeah. it's common so th those are classic examples of like hybrids yeah, that are I, not viable they can't make their own th exactly. there's no population of mules or ligers running around right now yeah it's and you common. know i think it's it those are the classic examples because we usually use human beings as the model for understanding the world <laughs> yeah isn't it so yeah. that's why we get this you know there's these norms that human beings have just you know made up or gotten used to and this is how then we look at the world and say okay do they do the same as us i think So these other organisms function like we do um but yeah. but you know life is life is a lot stranger than we can imagine for sure you know yeah for sure 100 but because of that ability to sometimes be able to to breathe with something and still produce um, offspring or things that kind of like look different but might be the same species or look the same but might be the different species this is where now modern technology comes in and kinds mm -hmm. of and kind of like okay we need to look on a much finer scale of how we can actually figure out and be able to you know as 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 scientists put draw the line in the sand of what potentially a species might be um and the best way that we can do it even though it's also probably fallible and not 100 percent i mean there's always sometimes has to be like you said earlier this, somebody has to make a decision you know one oh, yeah. way or the other but uh, right now the best tool that we have is genetics so actually like isolating the dna finding a sequence that kind of explains um th that certain grouping and then comparing the sequences or their code mm. of their of life or the barcode as as we talked about in that, another episode um and compare that between each other and see how similar that code to what makes them is yeah. on that fundamental level Yeah, absolutely. We actually have a nice a couple of episodes and podcasts about this, one on DNA and uh, one on the barcode of life. Um and uh you know, with this way of measuring and understanding the fundamental code uh of that codes for life itself, it it is very helpful. Uh but we still there's so much life, you know, <laughs> that that we still need to gather our data set and collect more and more information because uh you know now we're talking about something called like like gene pools right so dna makes up genes and then you have a whole pool of genes and now we can look at the as species as different pools right with different sets of information and does that information then travel between pools right and what makes a pool a pool right and we still need to make calls yeah. on that and we still need to get gather more information to to um, inform that what is the gap at which point how much different does the code need to be where we can say okay that's a different species and how how much different does it need to be for it to be a different subspecies because you know sometimes things are so closely related you know that we actually even divide it further we go from species to subspecies 
But certainly, look, genetic barcoding has helped a lot because uh, there, there are things that actually look exactly the same, right? They, they, they morphologically, they you know you can't tell the difference, but they are different mm -hmm. species. They don't mate with each other. There's no uh, you know interchange of genes between the pools, and, and sometimes it's because they just evolved to look the same. They mm -hmm. have actually not a common ancestor. Um, yeah. which is another thing that DNA can inform, uh, which is its phylogeny, you know? So the, mm -hmm. the, the history of the lineages of the families uh, of, of these organisms and uh, everything's kind of like related in this big tree of life. So now we've come full circle to that yeah. beautiful, <laughs> you know, symmetry, what we were talking yeah. about in the yeah. beginning uh, of our yeah. podcast. Yeah. <laughs> For sure, hundred percent. So it's it's, and also like we can talk about like we started also of saying about like the phylogeny. I mean the the morphology, right? Which is yeah. kind of looking at something, and based on their characteristics, kind of identifying him. Genetics is kind of like the same, just on a very micro level, because. Mm like the code that you're seeing is technically morphology it's it's a physical thing that makes up what they are it's coding for those things but on a fundamental level it is also something that you can look at and then base um, your identification based on how that kind of like looks even though it's a it's a genetic code um i think it's also good interesting to mention how like elegant the term like gene pool is because it, it combines so many aspects. Like I said, like it is the coding, which is also my morphology. Um, but it also in that gene pool, all all of the genes are kind of like being transferred between each other and how they mm. do that by sexual reproduction. Mm. Um, so that includes that uh, definition within there. Um, but also usually they're going to be in the same place and in the same niche. So it also includes the ecological definition in there and that's why like gene pool is one of the um, more useful. modern and the, yeah. the more yeah, practical ways now that we useful use concept yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure so but i mean you still need to do you still need to do all the work you still need to do the morphology uh go through the whole yeah. process yeah yeah, and, yeah, you, yeah. Know? you start you start from the top usually and like yeah. go all the way down. you do it all you know the best is to do it all because why because we still need to relate to older work you know what i mean we need to bring in the history uh, of previous descriptions and uh, so we basically need to redo so, some of the basic work that uh, naturalists and scientists have been doing over centuries ago and then you bring all of that in ideally you know to try and inform and to try and coalesce into like you know an agreeable and sensible sort of a bit of information about a certain organism which you know as you said in the beginning all of this can help for us to you know at least be a lot more confident that we are talking about the same organism <laughs> and therefore what we learn about it can be you know uh, organized very nicely and say we've learned you know what we're talking about it's this organism and here's our proof with all the different tools at our disposal yeah, 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 for sure so i think we've pretty much covered most of the, the fundamental ideas of, of what a species and i think while we're at it we also talked about like a history of taxonomy <laughs> <laughs> uh, kind of like offhand, which is which is also nice. Two birds, one stone. It, it, it's nice. It's nice. We need we need more taxonomists. And and I was talking to to a friend recently, and uh, you know if taxonomy if, if taxonomy was medicine, you know if it was medicine, mm -hmm. right? Then we also need more uh, para taxonomists. You know, like you know you have doctors and medics, and then you have paramedics. Yeah. Right, paramedic. Yeah, you need a paramedic. Sure. That that's like you know really important. We need a lot of paramedics so that we preserve yeah. life, yeah. isn't it? If there's a life or death yeah. situation, and I think the same is true for, for taxonomy. Yes, we need the specialists. We need those doctors and those you know uh, taxon experts that are the taxonomists. But we also, I think, need a lot of para taxonomists. You know, <laughs> yeah, para taxonomists. Yeah, so, I think it's a really cool concept. Yeah. Yeah, I think that is interesting. Somebody who's yeah, you can you can 
pull in on in an emergency like what is the name yeah. of this thing let me call it's the like first system. aid you know and, and we could <laughs> yeah. all learn a little bit of first aid but yeah. we could first learn, nomenclature you know, That's first good. nomenclature <laughs> Stay tuned for the next, you know, iteration of courses and, you know, training. Because it, 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 is, it is part of what you learn, like when you do citizen science, you know, if you use iNaturalist or if you, if you uh, do a project through the barcode of life, which, you know, you can do at the school level um, with teachers and scientists, you will essentially be learning these basic skills, like first aid skills, you know, so paratexonomy, why not? <laughs> Sure, 100%. I think it's a good spot to, to end the podcast on. If you want to find out more about stuff like this, future episodes that we'll talk about, I think we're going to tackle biodiversity at some point uh, because this kind of like leads into that. Once you know what species are, then you have to like kind of fit them together with other species, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of like the next step along the biologist's uh, like biology career at least learning about biology and especially ecology um yeah you can find us as we'll be posting things at a gullis current on twitter at a gullis current affairs on facebook and other places you can find me at geekoscopy uh geekoscopy.com or on twitter at geekoscopy what about you nelson and you can find me uh, at argonaut science on the internet argonaut is that octopus of course um, or just find me, Nelson. Nelson, the scientist. <laughs> Nelson at, Pod. At Nelsa, yeah, at Nelson Nelsa Pod. Pod. The account that he doesn't Nelsa use Pod. on Twitter. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. I'm, I'm very oh. shy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening and cheers. Cheers. Yeah, snail biologist. Gonna, gonna snail biologist, cheers. <laughs> <laughs>